una opción tener presente es Uh, I just want to start the presentation by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I know that Yudi covered some of the information of the last 10 years, but I want to tell you about the 10, no, not 10, about the 30 years before. Um, so, I was actually born in Brownsville, Texas, which is the southernmost tip of Texas and uh, bordering Mexico. My parents came from Matamoros, Tamaulipas, Mexico, when they were in their teens. Um, Soon after, uh, my family relocated to Santana in the late 70s. So I arrived here when I was four years old and I started school and learning English here in, in Santana. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I started writing when my father passed away. He passed away when I was 13. My parents were immigrants, so the idea of my mom having to go to work and, and having three daughters was a very difficult task to, to overcome growing up. Uh, because of our culture, because of our traditions, and there was a lot to deal with as a young person. And that's how I started writing. I started writing by, you know, journaling my ideas, the cheesy love poems that happened as well through high school. And then it turned into something that I just never shared with anyone. So I didn't start sharing my writing until I was 30. I'm 44 right now, so technically I'm a teenager writing. Um, because I've only been doing it and sharing it for 14 years. Um, I know that sounds like a lot to you all, but there are some writers that have been doing it and sharing it since they were very young. Um, so, and that led me to start Badger Writers. And Badger Writers got started in 2008. You have several Badger Writers here on your campus. In fact, Marilyn Montaño is an um, alum from Godinez Fundamental High School, and for five years she actually ran Badger Writers in Orange County. Uh, and so the idea of Badger Writers is to help you all express yourself, share your work way before I did, and get you published. So if you haven't heard about Badger Writers, this is a good time for you to Google it, not right now, but a <laughs> good time after the presentation. And we also have a website, so you can visit bodywriters.org. One of the reasons that I wrote Santana's fairy tales is because I am very proud to be from Santana. Although my, my father passed away at 13 and my mom moved us away, my, my whole like uh, cultural upbringing, my pride, why I speak, you know, two languages, Inglés and Español, um, why I take pride in the history of, of, our, of my family and our gente and of this city happened in the first, you know, years of my life here. I grew up off of Harper and Hazard. I went to um, Hazard Elementary. Anybody go to Hazard Elementary? No? Maybe? A couple? Oh, there's a hand way back there. Yeah, so I went to Hazard Elementary. I went a couple years to St. Joseph's, and then I went back to public school, and I went to Irvine Junior High. Irvine is not in Irvine. Um, it's actually in the Garden Grove School District. And then when my father passed away, my mom moved us away, and I went to a high school in South County, which was an amazing, um, a, 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 like an incredible cultural shock experience for me. Um, I'm the first one in my family to, go to, um, to finish high school in the United States. I'm the first one to go to college. I'm also the first one um, to do art. Yeah. Um, now, if you still ask some of my family members what I do, they have no idea. They say, I am this crazy 40-year-old with tattoos. I don't know what you're doing with your life. And I just got married this year, so can you imagine being a uh, <laughs> But until June, my family would always say, ¿Cuándo te vas a casar? ¿Cuándo? Ya estás escribiendo muchos libros, pero ¿cuándo te vas a casar? Right? And until this past June, my family thought I was like lost and not, still not doing anything important. Uh, because they don't understand the value of art, and they didn't understand, and I was never told I can be an artist. I was never told that if it has a career, that there's a possibility for me. Eran cosas de los gringos, And, I mean, it's serious. That's what my parents used to say. Those things don't happen to us. We don't live in that world. And 
And for me, when I started writing, I said, why can't, why can't I get published? Why, why can't it happen to us? Um, and that's what I started doing. And until recently, my family really didn't understand what that meant. And I personally didn't either. But I got to Grand Central Art Center in 2016 to do Santana's Fairy Tales. And at first, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just was told, you can get an artist in residence. Does anybody know what an artist in residence is? No, right? So an artist in residence is an opportunity to do art, and someone pays you for it. A lot of I didn't know about these things until a couple of years, or about three or four years ago. And you don't need a degree in most times. Sometimes you do. I have a master's of fine art and creative writing fiction with, with a cognate and, multi, and uh, media studies. What does that mean? That means I write fiction and I like to criticize movies and art. Um, and most of the time the way I criticize it is by counting how many people of color are on the page or on the screen and how they portray their culture and their language and their being to the rest of the world, right? Um, to me, it's really important that we don't have stereotypes on the screen, right? When I leave Santana and I ask folks, does anybody know where Santana is? Most folks say, no. I ask, do you know where Newport Beach is? Real Housewives, they say yes. I asked, do you know where Disneyland, Anaheim is? They say yes. I was like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're the meat of it. We're in the middle. We're the best part. Uh, and that's because often everything that's in the headlines is negative, right? Especially um, everything going on right now across the nation. When people think of Santana, unfortunately, they think of negative things. And that happens what's portrayed in the media, what's portrayed in the books, what's portrayed in the newspaper, what's portrayed in, in films about Mexican and Mexican-American residents of the United States. So when I thought of Santana's fairy tales, that was the thing. I want to share our stories. Use the stereotypes that people already put out there and change the perspective of it. So I started with, um, the first story I wrote is called Soraida y Marisol. Soraida is the godmother of life or death. Soraida grants trans gente a vital wish at their last breath. Has anybody heard of Soraida Reyes? Soraida Reyes was an undocumented trans woman here in Santana who did amazing activist work for undocumented and transgender communities. Unfortunately, she was also murdered in 2014. Um, they found her body uh, in the Dairy Queen uh, in the dumpster or behind the Dairy Queen in Anaheim. Is Anaheim, right? Anaheim. When they first released her story to the media, like the very first publication where they're announcing her death, they made it a man-on-man -man crime. So they changed her whole story that she worked really hard for her life, right? They released her birth name and they released her gender as male. So that erased everything she did. And of course, the, the community, especially a lot of folks here in, in, in Santa Ana, um, started you know, resurrecting her name, changing that narrative through protests, through vigils. The LGBT Center of OC also got heavily involved to, change, to, to give her the respect and the, the remembrance that she deserved. And that's how her story started getting out. Um, and at the time, I was in my MFA program in Texas, and I was hearing about it. I had met her in passing, but I didn't know her very well. I couldn't, I mean, I have her phone number, I couldn't call her. But I was friends with one of her really good friends, Alexa um, Vasquez, who's also an undocumented trans woman and an amazing writer. Um, and I started talking to her and saying, I want to write a story about Soraida. However, I'm not undocumented. I am not queer. So how do I write this story? Um, because I don't like it when other people write about Mexicans or Mexican Americans and portray them wrongly. So I want to be respectful and honor her life without taking um, the story to a, a negative place for, that co for those communities involved. So I started interviewing Alexa Vasquez and then the story came out of Soraida. And the idea is that Soraida becomes the godmother to trans gente at their last breath because unfortunately a lot of transgender people, um, folks are murdered or die across the nation and they go unnoticed and unmentioned. 
And I think it's really important for us to honor folks who have worked really hard to create an impact on our world, especially like Soraya Reyes, who did amazing work for undocumented folks. Does anybody know what happened to the carousel? No? So originally the carousel arrived to Santana in the late 1980s. Um, it was the Chase family, along with two other Mexican-American um, entrepreneurs, that started Fiesta Marketplace. A lot of people don't know this, but Fiesta Marketplace started because somebody petitioned to get a tax write-off. If they, if they build something that looks familiar to the local community, then instead of going to East LA or to Tijuana to buy products, they'll buy them in downtown Santa Ana as a way to capitalize on our culture, as a way to capitalize on us, right? But of course, our community, we're really excited. We have things that are familiar, right? They, they literally took the idea from Guadalajara. Guadalajara, if you go visit Guadalajara, Mexico, there are streets full of wedding dresses um, and, and quinceanera shops um, in La Plaza. And so that idea was brought here to Santana for, for folks to buy their quinceanera dresses, for folks to buy their boots and their hats and whatever you needed. So that was the original idea of creating Fiesta Marketplace, to create a central point for people to go shopping. And the carousel was put in as an opportunity to, to bring more people to downtown, right? Um, and it worked. It was beautiful. But what feel, folks didn't know is this was on an agreement with the city, and it, took, it, it was on an agreement on a certain amount of years. It was 25 years. Guess when the 25th year was? Hmm? 2011. Guess what happened in 2011? The carousel was removed. And that's when the changes started, right? And folks say they're removing our culture, se llevan nuestra cultura, están, you know, they're erasing. But the truth is, what people don't realize, it was never about our culture. It was about capitalism. It was about who's going to spend money here? Who do we have in our in our city that will spend the most money on these products. But then changes started happening, and they no longer had to empower the local entrepreneurs. So, and by, by 2011, the two Mexican-American entrepreneurs sold out to the Chase family. And that's when a lot more changes started happening, right? So when people say, oh, they removed the carousel, it's like you have to ask, why did they remove the carousel? The Chase family actually put in the carousel. They bought the carousel, they put it into downtown Santa Ana, and they offered it to the city, the city of Santa Ana. And they said, we're gonna donate this carousel to you. You can do whatever you want with it. We're just gonna take it out from our shopping area. And what they did is they just took it out. They didn't dismantle it, they just chopped it up and took it out. And it sits in the city yard. The only reason I found this out was because I interviewed a couple of historians in the community. I've interviewed Gustavo Arellano, I interviewed Ben Vasquez, um, I've interviewed um, Manuel Escamilla, who's also a historian for the city. And it was Manuel, uh, Manny Escamilla who gave me the information. He goes, oh, I know where the carousel is. It's in the city junkyard. And we were able to get permission and be able to, to feature it in the exhibit. But, um, what people don't realize that this cycle of changes started even before the 1980s. It started with this man here. Does anybody know who this is? William Spurgeon. He is the founder of Santana, Tustin, and Orange. He paid $8 an acre for all that land. We could all afford that if we paid $8 an acre, right? Um, and so William Spurgeon, Spurgeon Intermediate, Spurgeon Street, right there, Spurgeon Building, that's where this man comes from. And he came in, in the, a century before the 1980s, so in the 1800s. And Santana used to be an area where a lot of the migrant workers, where the immigrants lived at. And then when he bought the land, within one year, he caused all these changes and the Mexicans were pushed out within one year. And then after that, we have a section of Santana that's called Logan Barrio. Does anybody know where Logan Barrio is? 
So Logan Barrio, um, what people don't realize, a lot of folks don't realize, um, do you all know this mural? Right? Let me get to the... Yeah, right? We all, we all heard about this mural. At least recently because it was tagged. Um, so Logan Barrio is this, is this neighborhood in Santana. What do you all know about Logan Barrio? Huh? Did you all know it's the first area in Santa Ana where Mexicans could buy homes? That was the only place Mexicans could live and buy homes. So one thing to remember is that what's, the changes that are happening today are way, way deeper than the 1980s. They go back to the 1800s. And they're not any different. It's all about capitalism and it's all about the spending of money and making money and and isolating people right and segregating and I think those are the things that was was most important to me in creating Santana's fairy tales is telling the stories in the actual book we have six stories the first one the carousel's lullaby that shares with you um, the history of Santana how it got founded the villain in the story his name is Senor Billy Spurgeon all right um, and then the next story is Soraida and Marisol. So with Soraida and Mar Marisol, um, the story is about the fairy godmother of life and death. And then the next story is Hector and Graciela. Hector and Graciela, have you guys heard of the Grimm's fairy tales? Right? Did you all know that fairy tales were never for children? Fairy tales were originally written for adults. The Grimm's fairy tales are from Germany. There's tons of fairy tales in Ireland as well, from Ireland. Um, and they were to tell stories to warn people of like of morality, of ethics, and what to do and what not to do. Um, and be careful of certain things, right? Legends and like, like La, La, La Llorona. Does everybody know La Llorona? Yes, right? So La Llorona is una leyenda, un cuento que te está enseñando algo, ¿verdad? La Llorona, you don't go to the train tracks, you don't go near water, you don't go, right? Like, because La Llorona might come and, and surprise you. So the idea of these, of the Grimm's fairy tales is that. But what happens again? What happens? What, where do we hear fairy tales now? Disneyland. Is there a La Llorona in that one? Kind of, the witch, right? The witch is that, that if you don't marry the, the prince, the white prince, then something bad might happen to you. Um, so they change the narrative. They're happily ever after. Grimm's fairy tales are not happily ever after. So with Hector and Graciela, I'm talking about the issues rooted here in our city. When parents are undocumented and their children are U.S. citizens, how does that affect? Everybody believes in the American dream. It's like a fairy tale. Everybody believes that if you come to the United States and you work hard, your life will just become so much better, right? But what happens with the children that have undocumented parents? Their life is no different than another family that's completely undocumented. They still have to worry about where they live. They still have to worry what happens if their parents get deported, right? It's the same conversation black families are having with their sons, right? They warn you about police brutality. They warn you about stereotypes in society. And it's the same conversation that our families, Latino families that are, come have undocumented status, have to have with their children. They have to warn you if they go missing one day, what will happen to them. And so Hector and Graciela is an homage, like, um, an homage means like, Playing, paying respect, giving props to Hansel and Gretel. So when you read Hector and Graciela, I, I hope that you also go read Hansel and Gretel and see the difference in the stories or the similarities. And then the next story is When the Mural Speaks. I interviewed Carlos Aguilar. He is the painter of the mural. And I wanted to know why did you paint a mural about veterans, right? This is a funny story. So, Carlos Aguilar said, I'm tired of the stereotypes. He's a labor worker. He goes, you know, um, does construction on a daily basis. 
But he says, I want to change the stereotypes that people have in, about Santana. I didn't want to do just another mural about La Raza or La Gente, like, you know, the Chicano pride. I wanted to do a mural that incorporates us and reclaims history, reconstitutes history. Can anybody tell me how many Mexican-American soldiers died in World War II? It's a big number. No one? 500,000. Yeah, dang, right? So by the interest of war veterans, it's quite honorable. I'm just wondering why a guy like you is doing this work, I guess. No offense, kid. Oh, I'm not offended, sir. It's not the first time a guy like you questions me. Not offended at all. Maybe a little too used to it. Maybe you should read the names of these men. Stare at their faces, like, really hard. Let the art speak to you. Maybe they will tell you why a guy like me is making sure everybody notices them. They too fought for this country, but few of them get recognized when they walk through our streets. Especially by guys like you, sir. I get lost in the sun's eyes sometimes, lying above California's blue and pink dark sky. She stares back at me through hypnotic swirls, trying to find me beneath those mural-covered buildings. She spots me in the little coffee shop playing Loteria. Inside, her rays illuminate the room as I place my next beat on the card. El violoncelo reminds me of what my father dreamed of becoming while working to survive until the next sunrise. Outside the window, a low rider passes by. The car knows that if he steps outside home, he will reflect red and blue lights. But home is still the parking lot next to Jack and the Fox. Home is still the slot meet near Anaheim that opens every Sunday, Saturday. The sun knows this. She visits them in the early morning to keep an eye on them. I see her shining down on me on my way to the silent office where she isn't allowed. But when I make my way to colorful alleyways covered with dreams, I find her warmth pigmenting my skin to match my father's arm. The sun can always find me there, staring at her until she fades away into red and orange streaks. I get lost in those two, but I always find a way back home. Actually, you're a lot your writer is a good person to ask advice from. Next, I'm going to introduce you to Cassandra. She is a sophomore, and she's going to share her I call this poem incomplete. Going, growing up, you go through so many special events. Growing up, you go through holidays, your quinceanera, your not-so-amazing high school experience, first job, first car, and next thing you know, you're off to college. Growing up without you felt like my special events weren't complete. Happy celebrations turned into can you see me. I would hope you didn't see me sad because I felt like something was missing. I pray that you would catch me when I fall so I won't damage the past to my future. I pray for you to make me strong so I can lift myself up when I hit rock bottom. Fighting the tears feel like a constant uphill battle because I know you want me to die. Uh, 
But because of gender roles and situations that happen to young ladies when you start to have menstrual cycles, that discouraged me to be personally. That's a great question. I've never gotten that one. Oh. Why do you think that so many are not bicep? Thank you. 